Ah, there we go. Now we're going to flip people upside down. <laughs> taking care of the poop, and now we're, okay. So why, when, how, and all of that should we do? Um, these are my disclosures. I'm not sponsored for this presentation, and I've been addressing prone positioning for most of my career. Um, I want to briefly discuss the physiological rationale behind it and the evidence for why we want to do this, and then really identify who, when, um, how, and how to prevent some of the complications um, when we do place patients in the prone position. Um, just a very brief on the physiological rationale. What the data has shown us is when I lie flat like this, um, I, the compressional forces of the heart push on the lung against the spine and you get this squeeze effect. And as a result, you increase the pleural pressure so it becomes more positive so alveoli collapse. And when you turn somebody upside down into the prone position, you're actually on the xiphoid, which is not that big of a bony prom prominence area. And so you only have about 4% of the lung tissue under the compressionable forces versus 17%. And as a result, the pleural pressure stays more negative, and that's where you get the recruitment that takes place. So how many of you have proned individuals? How many have seen changes in PaO2 from the 50s to the 200s? or higher on a single. You have to be recruiting lung if that's to take place. So on the lung ventilation, in supine you have a marked reduction in lung volume um, because of diaphragmatic impact and the abdominal and a whole host of others as well as the pleural pressure we talked about. As a result, there's some alteration in lung mechanics and uh, if you're dealing with disease of ARDS, you've got uh, compression atelectasis taking place and all of that contributes to hypoxemia. Um, so the goal in flipping somebody upside down is to improve that FRC, um, recruit LVLI so that you're not doing the uh, stress injury to the lung by the opening and closing of the alveoli, and as a result, it uh, occurs more homogeneous in the aeration, and as a result, it increases oxygenation. So what happens to perfusion? Basically, perfusion uh, becomes more uniform um, with dependent flow in the supine position. Laterally, when you turn, um, you get dependent flow, and it um, decreases as it moves up. However, originally they thought you had a similar change when you flip somebody prone that you would get more dependent flow, but that is not the case. It is um, equal distribution, and what you're getting is better aeration uh, for the VQ match. So why do we want to prone? We can attenuate mechanical, uh, or mechanical lung injury, um, the adelect trauma, that opening and closing, and potential value trauma. Um, we can aerate uh, collapsed alveoli, reduce the hyperinflation of the non-dependent areas, um, create more homogeneous and less stress ventilator-induced lung injury, decreasing barrel trauma, and there's an added benefit. Even on 15 a peep, you can drain secretions when they're upside down. <laughs> so um, this was the French study that sort of got everybody proning again. Um, basically, uh, it was a randomized controlled trial, about 466 patients with severe ARDS, PF ratios less than 150, um, and they looked at um, 28 and 90 day mortality in the prone position. And in essence, what they found was a significant survival rate, um, roughly about a 40% improvement, and that got everybody's attention. And it looks as you're talking about a number needed to treat of six in order to save a single life from a positioning strategy, which is pretty powerful when you think about it. And when you look at the most recent prone meta-analysis, it was nine randomized controlled trials looking at about 2,200 um, patients. Uh, they sort of they sort of looked at um, if you were also doing low tidal volume, if you also had the right amount of PEEP, and at what point you proned them from a time perspective. And literally what the data showed is that 150 to 100 PF ratio range is where we want to target. Also, they, um, the patient should have enough PEEP. And from a recent four-week international survey on ARDS, we don't do that well. Um, so it should be greater than 10 and also prone for longer than 12 hours. And those are the ones that they've been able to identify good success. And so a lot of us um, are using the Berlin definition of ARDS and being able to target the patient in the severe 
Um, so some of the moderate, depending, and mostly the severe patient population um, at which to prone. So who do we want to place <clears throat> in this position? Severe ARDS, if you're not including the PEEP, then you'd look at a PF ratio that less than 150. Um, there were new guidelines that came out from SCCM and the American Thoracic Society that basically gave it a frontline therapy for patients in severe ARDS, that as much as low tidal volume ventilation, and that the course should run between um, longer than 12 hours. So most of the research was done around 16 or 18. Now they also um, are partnering up with this concept because in the original prone um, study by the French group, they used neuromuscular blockade for a very uh, short period of time, like the 48 hour time window. Um, and so there is a discussion of best outcomes with prone positioning in combination with low tidal volume and the short course of neuromuscular blockade. And by the way, the only one that's been tested related to this is cisatricurium. So who not to place? Facial and neck trauma. These are uh, pretty logical when you think about it. Recent sternotomy, they have an open chest. Um, their ICP is out of control. Um, if you think they are going to need CPR relatively <laughs> soon. It's not fun to do it in the prone position or to have them flip them back fairly quick. Some of the things to think about, um, pre-oxygenate, empty the stomach if it's full, um, but the best thing to do is let that digest so that you're not removing it. Suction the endotracheal tube, double secure it because when you go down, you're going to get a lot of secretions. So you want to make that's okay. Make sure it's good. Um, I sort of cut the body in half. Any lines inserted above the waist, go to the head of the bed, bottom, go at the base and, because you're like turning a patient in a rotisserie spit. <laughs> 180 degrees, so the lines will just cross this way and they'll cross right back. Um, I always make sure that there is a human at the head of the bed that is literally holding the endotracheal tube, not the ventilator tubing, and they don't let go until there is an all clear as a part of that. Um, develop an exit strategy if you do need to move them back quickly, and also please consider um, the placement of the uh, five layer silicone dressings or the new uh, pressure shear reducing dressings at the face areas and the chest and the pelvic area to reduce. So who have the patients that have been positioned in uh, prone successfully? Open bellies. Yes, open bellies. <laughs> All sorts of patients on CRRT, patients with ECMO, patients um, even with morbid obesity, but you've got to have all the right tools um, in order to effectively do that without hurting um, the staff themselves. So ensure you have the correct number of staff if you're doing this manually, um, somewhere between three and five. And there are what I affectionately call slide and glide sheets and slide and glide sheets with air that make this whole puppy easier. <laughs> as a part of um, the journey. It's sort of um, a pancake method where you put sheet on top, tuck them in, sheets on the bottom, and you roll as a part of it. Now, it's much more complicated than that, but uh, if you were here this morning and you saw that procedure manual, we also put a manual proning guideline in there as well. Immediately prior to the turn, limit your cables as much as possible. I don't disconnect any IVs. Then you have to re-zero your transducers and pay attention to the mouth and protect um, the eyes as a part of that. Um, when to stop proning, uh, what was done in the research is um, the, if they reached an improved, sustained, PF ratio in the supine position for longer than four hours, they consider discontinuing the use of prone. Um, some will try episodes, um, uh, but if there is no response in a 48 hour period, they're done. So consider proning uh, consecutively for 16 hours. If the patient demonstrates um, decompetent or they decompensate, um, monitor them for a short period of time because most critically ill patients when they're turned um, need about 10 to 15 minutes to re-equilibrate to that gravitational position change. Move the head slightly every hour. You don't have to swing it, but you need to move it enough that you're reducing the pressure. Um, swimmers on the arms, exercise, range of motion, pay attention to whether somebody has brachial challenges, um, and feed them while they're upside down. Um, and consider whether you want um, to deal with 
small vomitus or big vomitus as to whether you use the reverse Trendelenburg. Um, maintenance care, there is, um, if you have any problems with NGs, this is sort of like splitting the tape. I'll show you an example here. Splitting the tape so that it suspends and wraps around so that it's not hard against the nose as a way to protect. Um, also, again, uh, my colleague at University of Michigan that's been proning over 30 years, they'll take the CRRT bags, take some of the fluid out, and almost use it like a gel pad. <laughs> Potential complications, we've seen this in the research literature, temporary increases in um, airway pressures, sometimes that is related to kinking, vascular kinking to, can take place. There has been some evidence of increased gastric residuals, but probably the biggest issue is pressure injuries that take place. Um, it's beyond my scope to go through this, but I wanted you to have it, is that we have to get beyond this concept that patients are too hemodynamically unstable to move. They establish a gravi gravitational plane, and the longer they hang out in that plane, the more unstable they will be when you try to turn them. So there are many methods and strategies um, to be able to train a patient to tolerate mobility as a part of it. Questions that remain, what's the optimal peak when the patient's in the prone position? Does effective prone positioning necessitate the use of neuromuscular blockade? There is an association. But what impact longitudinally does that have on ICU-acquired weakness? And what's the staff's learning curve? How many have ever experienced somebody coming in and you've never proned and they go, we want to prone this patient? There is a safety issue associated with that, and so there should be a protocol. There should be practice um, as a part of this because it's an intricate therapy as anything else we do. And so in summary, use the prone positioning. Implement it early. Um, it's not one of those therapeutic things that say, oh, you know what, let's try it. There's nothing else left, and then you prone them and they die, and everybody says, well, that didn't work. So the therapy isn't proven like that. And develop a process and protocol and train people so that they are masteries at it. And thank you.